Welcome to the Mom Conference, helping you be the mom you want to be. The Mom Conference is brought to you by Nordic Track, the leader in home fitness equipment for moms and families. Hi, I'm Desi from the Mom Conference, and today we have Dr. Robert Malello and Tammy Bingham with us, and I am so excited because they have so much knowledge to share on the topic, what is happening in the brain of a child with learning, behavioral, or academic challenges, how to recognize it, and how to change it. Dr. Robert Malello is one of the most respected specialists in childhood neurological disorders in America. Dr. Robert Malello has been helping children overcome learning disabilities for over 20 years. His areas of expertise include autism spectrum disorders, ADHD, OCD, dyslexia, Asperger's, Tourette's, bipolar disorder, and other mental attention, behavioral, and learning disorders. He is also an expert in diet, nutrition, and neuroimmune disorders in children and adults. He is the founder of Brain Balance Centers, which have over 75 locations throughout the United States. And Tammy Bingham, here is her bio. Because of the profound changes the Brain Balance program made in the lives of their two sons and family, Tammy Bingham, a mother of four, and her husband, Bo, were determined to bring the miracle of Brain Balance to other Utah families. She now serves as the executive director over three centers with two more in development. And this is going to be such a great topic. We're going to cover a lot of things. But before we get to it, I'd just like to ask you, Dr. Robert, how did you even get into researching the brain and what ignited that passion in studying this topic? Well, it's kind of a long story, but to make it uh, shorter, um, you know, I'm a clinician. I've been a clinician for almost 30 years, and my um, areas of interest have always been revolved around neurology and rehabilitation and diet and nutrition. Um, and I got involved early with academics um, teaching clinical neurology. And along with that, I got into research and looking at brain development. And when I was just starting to get involved in academics, that was the early 90s when it was uh, the decade of the brain. Bill Clinton called it the decade of the brain. And, and all this brain research came out, more brain research in the 90s than really all of recorded history before that time. And also new tools were being developed like uh, fMRI and things to look at the brain in real time that were very exciting. And a lot of new information was coming out, a lot of new information about how the brain develops and how the two hemispheres work together and how when they don't work together how that can cause problems. Um, at the same time I was a father in the early 90s because I all started this around 95. Um, I was a, I had three young children and I had a friend and a neighbor who whose son was diagnosed with ADHD and she had been um, started a large parent teacher organization kind of like what you're doing, but in the old days, we didn't have the internet to do it. So, um, <laughs> a little different. She, uh, yeah. So she came to me and asked me, um, if I would, you know, give some advice to her and, and talk about what different types of approaches and treatments besides just medication and behavioral interventions. Um, so I started looking at that and when I first, the first statistic that I saw in 1995 that blew me away and everybody really was that the use of Ritalin um, between 1990 and 95 had increased 250% and no one really knew why. Mm -hmm. um, but now I was a father of three small children and my oldest son, one of his best friends had just been diagnosed with ADHD and my teacher, his teachers were telling us that he had some attentional problems and that I had parents in my practice that were coming in and asking me about their children and all of a sudden it seemed to be you know a big topic and so both as a professional and as a parent I started really looking into it and I had already been teaching brain uh, rehab and brain neuroanatomy and I knew a lot about the brain 
But I didn't know, and, and I came to find out that almost no one knew what ADHD was in the brain. So for me, and really what started brain balance and what started everything, was that question, what is actually happening in the brain of a child with ADHD? And then later on, that same question went on to autism, dyslexia, OCD, Tourette's, because they all come in combinations, and they're all diagnosed together. So... You know, it was that, um, you know, as a parent of children, and all of my children have had different issues, um, and they've been through, and I've, I've worked with them on this, so I've had personal experience with this, but also from a professional standpoint. You know, I love that, because I think sometimes that's what stems that desire to know more as our kids, and how to help them, and I know, Tammy, you have such a fabulous story of your own kids and how his research has helped your kids. And after you tell us your story, we'll get into what was happening in the brain that you found out. So tell me, tell us a little bit about your story. Okay, and I'll, I'll be brief as well because mine's extremely long um, <laughs> too. But essentially I had I had three, three kids at the time and my two older boys were struggling and it was really, really difficult on our family. Um, just every part of our family, you know, financially and, you know, just emotionally, all the things that, that go on when you have a child, even if it seems like it's a minor struggle, it affects the whole family. And, you know, one of my sons was very, very intelligent, very smart, could memorize well, um, seemed pretty typical, but then on the other side, he just really struggled with his emotional skills. He would melt down, you know, more easily than he should for an uh, eight-year-old child. You know, this went, you know, like I said, it had gone in quite a few years. We started noticing three and four, some things that were a little strange, but thought, oh, well, he's smart and everything's go good. Out of it. We'll figure it out. And, you know, but by the time he got to eight, and now I was homeschooling him because kindergarten hadn't worked. He couldn't stay in his chair. He was wandering around in circles, you know, and the teachers just thought he was a bad kid because he was mm. so smart. He should know better and should sit in his chair and so it was just really difficult uh, homework and the work we were doing would take two three hours of whining and you know emotional meltdowns or fighting to to do to take 20 minutes um, uh, and so draining as a parent so hard <laughs> well and it's it's so frustrating because as a parent you go well what am I doing wrong right my child's yeah. really smart or my child's really athletic or whatever it is how come they can't do this how come they can't remember these spelling words how come they can't mine couldn't ride a bike still by eight why can't he do this why does my son not want to throw a ball and has no interest in playing sports with his dad or or going to play with those friends you know and and it's very frustrating because again we think okay it must be me I we must personalize be it as moms we do and then we also go or maybe my my kid has you know like maybe he's just a bad kid and maybe I don't you know and it's and neither of those and and so my other son was also struggling much more severe he was diagnosed with autism he by the time we went to brain balance was six but he had um struggled his entire life from about one year old 18 months or so and even though he was diagnosed he couldn't communicate he still at six was not potty trained um, oh. which is very difficult That's but so hard. he at two years old knew every one of his letters he could spell he started writing and teaching himself to write and he'd write sentences and words and we mm. thought how in the world can you spell but, but not you can't go to the bathroom or the toilet or even respond to it you know hey you know you know, what's your name or anything I mean, he wasn't really even communicating and so we had done prior to brain balance for almost five years of almost every research therapy there is out there not all of them because there's a lot that you can do but you know we did all of the different biomedical interventions um you know definitely nutrition is a huge part but we had done that route and thought okay well there's minimal change but we still had a long way to go um they had bowel issues stomach problems that we were addressing with doctors all over the country we had done hyperbaric oxygen we had done the intensive behavioral and aba therapies for years and years oh my goodness you know, everything under the sun everything and we got to this point where we said, I mean, what is a mother i mean you want to help them you want to do everything in your power you do and the thing that makes it different that i've realized is that it's because you see the potential if you have a child that you feel has you know this is pretty much where they're at maybe they have a, a disability or something you're not continually searching for something to really improve their life because they kind of don't have the capacity to i know that sounds sad but some kids you just can't right they're just mm -hmm. like this is how they are and this is what we have but when i see these boys that both had these amazing abilities and other strengths why can't they do the other things? It didn't make sense to me as a mom, and I wasn't going to settle for it and say, well, I guess this is all they have. And so I kept looking, and 
when we ended up finding out about brain balance, we were kind of, we were at a point where it was like, okay, we're pretty much about to give up because there's nothing that helps. We spent more money than you want to know. No. And it didn't, it wasn't working. And we figured we're, we're going to be doing this forever. They're going to be living with us forever. And, you know, even these great kids. And so brain balance was the first but the first program and the information I learned there that said, we know why. We know why your child is amazing in certain areas, yet struggles in others. We know how to fix it. And, you know, and they confirmed, which I already knew as a mom, that nothing was broken. You know, there wasn't some horrible big thing going on. It just something wasn't working right. Things weren't clicking that I felt should be able to click for a child. And, you know, a lot of people on the outside didn't see a big issue with Brody. Hey, you know, seems just like a typical kid, maybe hyperactive. But for me, I could see all the pieces that weren't coming together for him. And it started to affect him you know I'm I'm a bad kid and I'm just not smart or I'm not good enough and I kept saying no 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 that's not true but next time just don't do it again but he couldn't I could okay, recognize that he would try and it'd still run right in the road and I'd say Brody do we go in the road no the cars will hit me and I could die and it would be horrible he knew that but at the time that he needed that information it never came it always came after and same concept with spelling words or whatever it is. And so Brain Bell said, we know what it is. We can help. And, you know, we can do it rapidly. And I thought, okay, well, you know. Yeah, I, you're like, I've heard that before. Yeah. But at the same time, it was the first thing that made sense. The first thing that actually, rather than just saying, well, your child does this because they have autism or because they have ADHD, it was like, well, we know why. It's, you know, different Something's not firing right in the brain. Exactly. And I'd love to get... Dr. Morello's side of this too of what was going on in their brains like what what research did you find and maybe we'll jump back to what happened after you applied all of this knowledge okay well actually you know what Tammy was saying was that you know when I first went out because I I knew a lot about the brain I knew a lot about neurology I knew a lot about rehabilitation um, I just when I first started didn't know a lot about what ADHD was but my instinct as a clinician was just show me what's wrong in the brain and I'll see what I can do to, to improve it, right? Um, so I went out to people and asked that question to people that I thought would know, pediatricians, pediatric neurologists, uh, people that were friends of mine, colleagues, neuropsychologists, psychologists, and I asked them, what is actually, what is ADHD in the brain? And they all looked at me and said, you know, I don't think anybody has any idea. We have no idea what, what it is. And I said, that's Wait interesting a second. that that wouldn't have been studied. And, and, you know, the funny thing is that today, I mean, if you see any of my lectures on YouTube or if you see me lecture, and I lecture all over the world, I'm leaving next week to go to Copenhagen and then Stockholm. And everywhere I lecture, first question I ask any audience is, and they're all people, professionals generally, or moms or uh, teachers or whoever that work with children with disabilities and the first question I ask is who can stand up and tell me what is happening in the brain of a child with autism or ADHD and everywhere I go the answer is the same nobody has any clue and so right off the bat you know to me you see that that's a problem. I mean, if you're trying to work with these issues and you're working with these children and you have no idea what the actual problem is. Which is the root then, of everything. I mean, you know, right. you might be able to treat everything that all the symptoms that are coming out, but if you're not getting to the root of what's going on. Right. Yeah, you're just managing symptoms, but also you can't say things. You can't say what causes it if you don't know what it is. You can't say what can, whether it can get better or not, you know, and so, uh, you know, a lot of misconceptions, like people are told that these are genetic issues and there's nothing that can be done about it. That's completely inconsistent with the research. Which, um, I mean, as a mother, that's such a terrible thing to hear. That there's no hope. There's nothing you can right. do. That it, this is how it is, you know, because like that's Tammy what it, said, you, you recognize that potential in them, you know? Yeah. And that's where a lot of professionals were under the operation of why even try because there's nothing I can do about it. So when I did start, then I started looking for myself and saying, well, I'm going to go, going to, go to the research myself and try to figure this out. And there was some good research being done, but all of it really right off the bat jumped out because it talked about this unevenness of skills that Tammy just highlighted, that these children had certain things that they were better at 
you know, better than some things they were poor, some things they were good, some things they were exceptional. And in most cases, all of these children were recognized to be very bright in many areas, but they struggled in others. So right from the beginning, there was some sort of imbalance uh, that was being recognized, but no one understood what it was or how it got that way or what you could do about it. And for me, again, a lot of the research that we had been doing was starting to look at the idea of the right and left hemisphere. And there was new research coming out and talking about that. And there was some research implying that ADHD and autism may have something to do with a right brain problem or and dyslexia was shown to be more of a left brain problem. So that's where it really all started. And I went into the research and found that um, basically, in ADHD, everything that they did well was a left brain skill, and everything that they struggled was with was a right brain so skill. Wait, let's clarify really quick for the moms listening about the different hemispheres. What is the left brain? What is the right brain? And what are their functions? I give you a really quick synopsis. The left brain is all about details. The left brain is logical. It's linear. It controls verbal language like spelling and reading and writing and anything that has to do with that. It controls most of our dominant functions like handedness and footedness and your dominant eye and your dominant ear. Handedness um, like your right hand, your left hand. Right hand or left okay. hand, right. Um, and it is um, about sequential information one step at a time so something that follows in a sequence it's about a pattern it's about pattern recognition type of things so the left brain is all about looking at the world breaking it up into little pieces lining it all up in a row to kind of figure out what the pattern is and predict what's going to happen yeah. right so, so i'd love to trolling. know tammy was your son left brained Yes, right both brain. both of them are very left brain, and you know, and like he was talking about earlier, you know, when people say it's this big genetic problem, you know, I realized, well, I don't have autism. No one in my family has autism. How can this be purely genetic? But when we learned about, listen, they have a left brain dominance, which is okay. It's okay to have that. My husband's an attorney. He's very left brain. It's great, right? The problem was they didn't have enough right brain to balance that out. And so they were very, you know, kids with autism will line things up, right? And they'll line everything up or they'll, you know, people that are very left brain are organized and they have everything, you know, color coded or labeled and these things, which is, they you know, like everything structure, they right. like to see which isn't things. a bad thing. If the no. right, brain, the right brain that says, Hey, somebody messed up my stuff. Does you know if it works, then okay, I can deal with it. If it doesn't work, that can't handle it. And so they couldn't like the left brain doesn't like change. Like he, he that loves routine and repetition. And so it was the same movies over and over, the same books over and over, the same even the same conversation that tell you the same thing over and over. And you know I'd be like, great, let's talk about something else. You know, but I realized too that even though Brody was verbal, he could talk to you. He didn't talk with you. There wasn't the back and forth. He didn't read the nonverbal cues, which we'll talk about with the right side to say, okay, I can, I can say words, but do I really know, you know, how close to be to your face and what your face is saying right now when you're rolling your eyes at me or whatever it is, he didn't get those pieces. So I kept which, seeing, which, how do you teach someone? You know what I mean? That's, that is yeah. firing of the brain. That's, like, that's, there's that's where parents beat them heads, their heads against the wall is because Brody, you don't say that to people. Why not? It'll hurt their feelings. Why? Because they'll make them sad. Why? And he didn't, you cannot teach nonverbal. Yeah. You can't teach empathy. And I tried over and over and over and it doesn't work. If the brain doesn't naturally develop the ability to put itself in someone else's shoes, and if it doesn't even recognize its own emotions, how can I know your emotions? And so that's where it came down to. And so then Brody would say, well, I didn't want to hurt their feelings, but he couldn't read the fact that he was doing it. And so Aww. it made it really hard on him. But yeah, so they were both very left brain, which again was fine, but they didn't have the, the right, right brain wasn't up to speed. And yeah. so what is the right brain? So the right brain is really the social, emotional, and the attachment side of our brain. Um, it looks at the big picture. It sees everything all at once. It doesn't look at anything in details. Um, and so it controls the big muscles of our body. It's very spatial, so it knows where we are in space. It's very connected to the inner ear. It's very connected to controlling both eye movements. 
Um, and it really um, also feels not only the big muscles of posture and controls muscle tone, but it also is responsive to the muscles of facial expression. So it, it controls nonverbal communication. And mostly, if you look at children with right brain delays, which is what autism is and Asperger's and, and ADHD and OCD, their main problem really is a nonverbal uh, communication problem. They don't so read up on facial those social expression. cues or right. they don't hear or inappropriate. Voice. Exactly. They don't literally hear tone of voice. And as Tammy said, it also starts the right brain develops first in the womb and for the first two to three years of life. So it's very connected to our body. It, it lets the child feel their own body and then also connect to somebody else's body. It lets them read their mother's facial expression and start to understand emotions and how it feels and what emotions are and how it feels to them. It's literally like the mother transfers emotions into the child. The child then connects with those emotions and then is able to read them on other people. So the right brain is about building relationships. It, it's about building attachment. Um, and so the right brain is also more about what we call withdrawal behavior. It's more about protecting us and being cautious and stopping us from doing things that are socially inappropriate or things that are emotionally inappropriate or things that may hurt us or other people. It stops us. And the left brain is more about initiating it. The right brain is naturally obsessive. It's naturally impulsive. It's naturally compulsive. And the right brain balances that out and stops it. If the right brain isn't there, we just do the same thing over and over, like stims or like OCD or like tics or Tourette's or all yeah. those different types of things. Absolutely. So all of the, you can see that as you go through this list, it's very obvious that again, the things that are, you know, left brain are things that typically a child with ADHD or OCD or ADHD is really exceptional with or too strong. It's too strong. And the right brain skills are too weak. And that imbalance is the actual problem. Dyslexia is the exact opposite. Huh. And the severity of the difference between, let's say, a really severe autism and a mild ADHD is really the severity of the imbalance. The more they're imbalanced, the more severe the problem is. Okay, so what I hear you saying is, through your research on what was happening in the brain, you realized that one part of the brain was overdeveloped and one part of the brain was underdeveloped. And so yeah. there's a right and a left side. I have this fly. There's yeah. a right and a left side. And if they're not firing at this, you know, equally, then you're going to start seeing some of these symptoms. Exactly. True. And and is, it just, is it just, you know, maybe these bigger issues or could somebody have not bigger issues, but is it, you know, just ADD or just all those things? Or could a kid be emotionally struggling because one is overdeveloped over the other? You know what I mean? Yeah, like it, the big tantrums that all, you're seeing or... There's all combinations. And even the same thing is really what, it, what depression is in adults. Um, we know that depression is decreased activity in the left frontal lobe relative to the right. Anxiety and mania is the opposite. So... What, with all of this research that was coming out in the 90s, what we started to be able to do was look at the brain in real time and look at not only the physical connections, but also what we call functional connections, how the brain really talked to air, different areas and how it communicated. And mostly it communicated through timing, through coordination, through synchronization. And so what became apparent was there wasn't anything physically wrong with the brain. There were areas that had more connections and there were areas that had less connections but mainly it was just a breakdown in communication where the timing and the synchronization was off and you couldn't really see that. You can't see it with a picture. It's hard to measure it. And that's known as a functional disconnection. Huh. And that is what the actual problem is in all of these disorders, in all of them. 
Well, and, and like you were saying, there's different variations where both of my boys were left-brained and had a weaker right brain. You know, Brody was, okay, you know, typical in a lot of ways, but then over, you know, he's really smart. He was rigid. He didn't like change, you know, those types of things. His right brain was weak where he, you know, he wasn't coordinated. He couldn't ride a bike. He didn't, you know, understand all the social things. He wanted to be social though, where he, he just didn't know how he was trying to do it. Cues. Where you'll have other kids that don't even know how to be social. They'll avoid the social, you know, they won't have the eye contact. He wasn't like that. Again, most people thought he was a pretty typical, maybe hyperactive boy. So it's just the severity of Right. That and we're why it and we're why it, you know, his left brain, like I said, if you're two years old, you know every letter and you can start to spell words from an alphabet puzzle, but you can't use the toilet or even connect with your mom like a two month old baby was, you have a bigger gap between those two sides of the brain. Like and that makes so much sense to me because everyone just said, Well, he has autism. I'm like, Well, how come this child with autism can talk? And this one can't, and this one has social issues. They're all so different, it did not make sense. But learning that different areas are affected with every child and the, the gap between them, then it made sense as to, well, why he had bigger issues than where Brody was, right? And, yeah. and when I looked at that too, I thought, well, Brody, just, just for the parents out there, because this is the first thing I thought, which was Brody was very left-brained, right? Which means he should have good fine motor skills. And I said, well, then how come he can't do handwriting? How come he can't write? How come he'll whine for three hours about trying to write a sentence, you know, if he's supposed to be left-brained? And, you know, and I learned, you know, very quickly that you have to have certain right brain skills to be able to do certain left brain oh, skills. Oh, that makes sense. But even, you know, the precursors yeah. to those. Exactly. And so there were things that he didn't have enough of to do that. Now he had enough to build the Legos. And our left brain kids are little engineers and builders and they build with their Legos and they love their computers and video games and their Minecraft, you know, but to translate into handwriting that uses more right brain and spatial and you know, hand eye coordination and things like that, it wasn't happening. And so and that's, that's why where, he was melting down over doing homework because it was really hard for him to do. And it's, and it's hard because as a parent, you go, you know, this answer, right? Yeah. Tell it to me right like that. Now write it down. And it's like two hours later. And uh, so you just yeah. feel like, what is wrong with them? What's wrong with me? What am I not doing right? And, and it's neither, like I said. And so that's where the frustration comes in for most of the kids, you know, because again, I always say every child could probably use brain balance. Every child could use, every one of us probably could use, you know, something to I be able to get my brain balance <laughs> <laughs> to get a little bit easier than what it was. It doesn't mm. have to be something that seems really big um, or visual, but it can be holding them back. It can really make it hard for them to do a basic thing like ride a bike or a basic thing like sit in a classroom and not pay attention to every other noise going on or control right? their tempers or their emotions or exactly. connect with other people on their emotions right yeah because you know this one model really explains everything but it also as tammy was saying allows for the complete individuality yeah. so that no two children are the same I mean, essentially, we have hundreds of different centers on either side of the brain that control different functions, and we all have them. We're, we're, we have strengths and weaknesses naturally where we may be better at certain things than others, uh, but there's a certain balance if we develop normally. If both sides of the brain aren't really working well, what happens is that we may have, you know, the, the one area of the brain may be delayed, but it's not the same on every child. You know, those hundreds of centers, there may be only five or six that aren't working, but that five or six that aren't really developed may be different in every child, but they're all on the right side of the brain. So the idea is that, you know, what we do in brain balance, and, and one of the things, Desi, I think, you know, this may be a really confusing to people who are hearing this for the first time. So I really suggest that, you know, my book, Disconnected Kids, um, is a book that really explains it in, in a really simplified way and allows the parent, gives them checklists of all of these different skills and you're able to maybe assess. recognize in their own kids if it's not. Yeah, you can assess your own nice. child and recognize not only are they more right brain or left brain, but what is the makeup of it? You know, do they have more visual issues or auditory issues or motor issues or Immune. And it's important to understand that the brain controls everything, right? So not only is it about, you know, thinking skills and attention and, you know, movement and sensory, but it's also, we know that all of these kids have immune problems. 
they have digestive, digestive problems, problems and the brain controls that and the two hemispheres control it differently so that the left hemisphere increases the immune response the right hemisphere stops the immune response so if you have a kid with a right brain delay you know you may have an overactive immune system and what does that mean it means they develop all these food sensitivities like oh. to gluten or dairy or they may develop sensitivities to chemicals in the rug really? or it starts at the brain that's interesting it's the brain and that's the one thing that very few people understand but the brain is what causes most gluten sensitivity the brain is what causes leaky gut the so brain if you balance your brain could that help all of those yes absolutely and we see that in I mean, we're, we're going to work with, you know, between five and 10,000 kids this year and almost, and almost all of them, we, we look at an elimination diet and we, we look at their food sensitivities and we can see that in 90% of those cases, when they go through brain balance, all of their food sensitivities are either greatly diminished or gone and they can go back to a, to what, to a normal diet if they wish. And, and always a healthy diet because I'm sure that yeah, feeds the brain, you know, not just eating Cheetos right. every day, but, right. but yeah, right. I'm sure if you could get that balance, I could see And that that's one thing that, that I had that personal experience of. So prior to brain balance for four or five years, we had tried almost every diet there was. We had done a paleo type diet. We had cut out all of the grains. We had done lots of supplements. We had, you know, removed all the foods that people had said were, were very hard with, with these children. And it really, really clean. Everything was so clean. And, you know, it helped with the, the bowels a little bit. You know, they were diagnosed with Crohn's disease, so we had a lot of, you know, stomach and digestive issues. Um, and, you know, a lot of doctors and things that came along with that that were very costly. We kept removing the foods, but then if we would now switch to a different food and say, you know, rice instead or almonds instead, then all of a sudden that was starting to cause an issue. And we thought, well, it doesn't matter what we eat, it's going to end up causing an issue. And when we got to brain balance, you know, they explained, hey, they've got overactive immune system, which is, you know, causing that autoimmune thing. And we've got the underactive digestive system. And the, between those two, you're not going to be able to, even if you eat the best diet there is, break down the foods appropriately, put the right things in the right places, really be able to get proper nutrition. In fact, some kids are malnourished because their brain doesn't know what to do with the, the food that's going in. Even and though so, it's a really clean diet. They might exactly. Be exactly. And it continues to attack the food. And so like, even if you take out the gluten now you put in corn now it attacks the corn and you have a corn issue and so it didn't you know that alone so yes it's better of, yeah until you balance the brain out exactly you might see it play out in almost a lot of different exactly. things exactly so so what we did is once we did the brain balance program all of the medications they had needed for their bowel disease and all of the really restricted diets yes we continue to eat clean and healthy which we all should but we were able to say oh my word they can have potatoes now and they can have rice now and they can oh, have these foods so that they nice. could never ever eat i mean i would see immediate either stomach or bowel or emotional things connected to those food sensitivities and now they could eat them because the brain was now doing its job so i had been trying to fix their brain through their gut which is definitely important but this is what controls it all so you have to do them in, in combination both together. with both exactly so what causes this dr Melillo? i mean we're seeing this pop up more and more these days and it's more prevalent yeah. what right. what is the causes well again you know not to to sound like i'm promoting anything but uh, uh, my third book is called autism the scientific truth of uh, preventing, diagnosing, and treating autism spectrum disorders. And it's all about that. What causes this? What are the environmental factors? In that book, I have you know, identified in the research about 50 environmental factors now that are well documented. And these risk factors um, are really the same risk factors for all of these disorders. So for ADHD, for dyslexia, for uh, OCD. Um, suffice to say that, again, we are facing an epidemic. There's no doubt about that. My first chapter is all about that and looked at both sides. Um, and the numbers are staggering. I mean, ADHD increased 2,000% in the last 20 years. So now it affects mm -hmm. one in nine children, 11%. Um, we know that one in five high school boys have ADHD. 
Um, and it's a real disorder, even though some people try to say it's not. It, it, we, we, we see it. We've documented it in the brain. It's a real issue, and it's getting worse. Um, we know autism 30 years ago was 1 in 10,000. It's now 1 in 68 or 1 in 42 boys. Hmm. Um we look at dyslexia, learning disabilities affect one in, one in six, one in seven children. Um, so that what we see is that in 80% of children with ADHD have either OCD or Tourette's or both. Um, almost every child with autism has some form of tick disorder or some form of Tourette's or ADHD or OCD. So, so they're, it's on the rise, they're, what's causing it? Well, that's the thing. There are envir It's really primarily lifestyle factors. And again, you know, we don't want to dwell the good, you know, from a standpoint of somebody thinking about, I want to have a child um, and I'm worried about having a child with a disability. And right now you have a one in five chance of having a child with a disability if you have a child right now. Oh, wow. And that's getting worse. It's increasing at 15 to 20% per year. So, oh, and this fast, is a, Dr. And it's a real issue, but, <laughs> but it's you don't really have to be. Yeah. The good news is that by understanding the risk factors, these are potentially preventable, but even if they're not, you know, even if you're a mom, you know, or dad, because the risk factors are there for men and women. And so they're mainly, you know, environmental things like, you know, things like age or your diet or inflammation in your body or chemicals that you're exposed to or stress hormones, you know, our lifestyle is so much more stressful and unhealthy now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so many different things. There's, there's many Faster different pace, factors. What we eat, it's more processed. Right. Well, and the te time. technology, you know, is such a huge thing. Yes. How does technology Computers, affect, oh, sorry, go ahead. How does technology affect the brain? Well, it affects the brain in, in two ways, really. One is it has a direct effect on the brain. And what we know that it does um, is that it actually stimulates the left side of the brain and inhibits the right side of the brain, especially oh. an area called the orbital frontal area, which is really the area that is very responsible for socialization and empathy. So what we see is that you know, kids that are addicted to technology, which most kids are, and kids that are left brain dominant, which are most kids with ADHD or autism or OCD, they are attracted to technology even more because they love that. They have an engineering, mathematical, scientific mind. So it craves that. So it craves it. And then when you give it to them, they literally get addicted to it very easy. And what it actually does is it makes their problem worse. It literally builds their left brain and inhibits the growth of their right brain. So that's why the you might see thing, more meltdowns after watching TV or after right. taking away a screen. or Right. And they seem even less social. Um, and there's many, many studies that, that show this type of thing. But the other thing it does is that what builds the right brain and the most important thing to build intelligence and learning in young children is moving their bodies mm -hmm. and physically interacting with their environment, climbing trees, riding bicycles, literally communicating with other people and other children. Not texting. In the real world, right? Not in, in three dimension, not in, you know, with actual touch and smells and all this sensory input. That's actually what builds the, the basis of intelligence. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we can't make a computer that thinks like a human. I did a lecture at MIT to their artificial intelligence department on the fact that they don't know why they can't create a computer that thinks like a human. They can't create artificial intelligence, but they know it has something to do with something called embodiment. Without a physical body or without being connected to our body, which, again, most kids that have autism and ADHD are disconnected from their bodies. You can see it because they're clumsy, they're awkward, they have low muscle tone, they, they don't feel pain when they fall down, or they don't smell things. Yeah. Um, they're not connected to their body. And without that, you can't really build what we really know is true intelligence, which is really the empathy. ability to have empathy and to have self-awareness and then awareness of others. Oh. Um, and so you, the idea of 
getting them away from a computer and making them move and going outside and playing and running around and doing the things that the kids used to do that they don't do anymore. And, you know, a lot of parents don't allow their kids out because we're afraid. We're afraid that something's going to happen to them. You know, God forbid, you know, we let them ride their, ride their bike across town the way they used to. And they don't, um, you know, we don't see children outside playing as they used to because we're afraid to let them out. But we don't, we don't realize is in trying to protect them, we're actually damaging their brain. We're literally, we're literally retarding the development of their brain. And that's what this all is. We're not seeing damage. We're seeing their areas of the brain either on the right that just aren't growing. They're immature. And other areas of the brain that are very mature. So literally they have certain skills that are three or four or five years above where they should be. And they have other skills that are three or four or five years below. And that gap is the actual disability. That is the actual problem. And when we can balance that gap out, we can correct the problem. It's like a symphony that's off. Exactly. Can't, it doesn't sound right. I have a question for you. Is any screen time okay? Um, yes. You know, in, in, a, in a reasonable amount, we, we allow an hour and a half of screen time a day, maximally. Um, and that's all screen time. Um, where the average child now is, is actually up to about eight to 10 hours a day in screen time. Are you serious? Yeah. Yes. Including that's the, that's school the average and everything. in the United States right now. Digital input. So just imagine that in a young growing brain that is sucking up and absorbing everything around it. And that is what's making it grow. Um, I mean, you're getting eight to 10 hours of digital input into the brain in small children. I mean, it drives so it me just crazy. Like makes the one side <clears throat> way. Yeah. When I go to an airport or a restaurant and I see a little baby, two years old, like looking at a, at an iPhone, and you know, and then you take it away from them, and they're like crack babies. They start screaming and yelling, and then you give it back to them, and they soothe them. It's changing their brain, and it's mm -hmm. not changing it for the better. It's changing it for the worse. So you know, children shouldn't really even really use a computer before the age of six. They shouldn't touch an iPad or touch an iPhone. They shouldn't even see a TV screen before the age of two. And that's coming from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which isn't really a very forward-thinking organization. Right. So they, they came out recently with the, just in 2014. Here's your graph. This is how much Chi your child should have on a screen and it just says zero to two or three zero not a tv not a computer not an ipad and then after that very minimal 30 so minutes per is a no? no and in no. fact you know with with my boys you know i didn't overdo it i felt like i was a pretty typical parent but you know one of those things about typical parents is we want our kids to be smart right and so w if we do let them watch tv we give them educational things with letters and numbers and most of them are very repetitive dora the explorer does the same pattern over and over and over and so you know even though the technology itself wasn't good then they were also doing things that were only building their left brain when they don't need those. A two-year-old doesn't need letters and spelling and math. They need, you know, social skills and behavioral and emotional regulation. So literally by my children and lots of children sitting there and not moving their body and touching and smelling and seeing and playing in the dirt and all of those things, they literally skipped over areas of development. Mm. And so that's why I was like, well, why do I have brilliant children with none of these other pieces they skipped them. They just didn't even ever do them and experience them. And, and, and so they're not there. Whereas maybe all of us, we might have things we're not as good at, but we still can, you know, yeah. I still can. I always say my handwriting is not pretty, but I can do it. It's just not very good. Where I looked at my boys and I'm like, they literally don't even have it. They don't have it to do. And so, you know, if we're skipping over, especially those first three years of life, that critical part of brain development, then we're not going to have the things that we need well, to sit you know, still you or focus it, I think it's or anything. sad when you see, you know, little kids playing dress-ups on 
an iPad instead of like touching and feeling and dressing up their little dolls. You know what I mean? It's a completely different experience than swiping and putting, you know well, what I mean? It's hard because it's hard because everyone's doing it. Yes. We think it's going to make them smarter. We think it's helpful, you know, or and, and you want to get something done. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. That's another part of it. But you know, so. a friend of mine the other day, she was sitting in the airport and this little baby, you know, maybe one, two years old, they gave her a book and said, here's this book, you know, to read, right? To keep them happy. And literally the child was touching the book and trying to swipe it. Didn't even know how to turn the page like they should. And, and so it's, it's literally changing the way that we develop and, you know, we're, again, we're skipping those things and we need to move our body. And, and that's how babies develop crawling and climbing and all of those yeah, things. So and again, increasing, if, if increasing seeing, movement and decreasing times in front of the screen. Yeah. Absolutely. Or just sitting, right? Anytime that if they're just sitting and we have them strapped into a bouncy seat all the time or strapped into a car seat all the time, they are restricted and they can't move their body and either. It's so. not firing the brain. So what about diet? How does that affect the brain? Well, Diet, obviously, I mean, our brains are embodied, right? So they're inside our body. So whatever we put in our body is going to affect our brain in one way or the other. Um, fortunately, we have what's called a blood-brain barrier. So most of the bad stuff that we eat and put in our body is not going to cross that. But it still affects it, um, that the brain needs nutrients to grow. We need protein. If a child can't digest protein because the brain isn't allowing them produce acid or is not allowing them to produce digestive enzymes, then they can't digest protein. If they don't have protein, then it's really hard to build the brain when you don't have a lot of protein in your diet. You have some kids that eat all carbs. That's all they eat all day. I mean, I, I remember I saw one little girl that all she had was water and spaghetti all day. That's all she ate every day. Um, and, you know, the, the brain needs nutrients, the vitamins, uh, B vitamins, folic acid, um, all of these different things need to be. You can't absorb B12 in your gut if you don't have um, proper function or secretion of acid or secretion of proper enzymes. So you need to absorb vitamins, you need to break the food down, um, and you need it to grow. But if you're not breaking it down, if you're not absorbing it, you're not going to be able to, to, to have the basic resources. It's like trying to build a house and you don't have any wood and nails, you know? Can't yeah. happen. You may have a really good blueprint, but it doesn't, you know, you're not going to be able to build anything. So um, the other thing is that if you have a problem where you develop food sensitivities, now that creates inflammation. It's not a food allergy. It's not an allergic response like a peanut allergy. This is a food sensitivity like gluten. And what that does is that doesn't cause an allergic response. It causes an inflammatory response. And so it literally causes their whole body and their brain to be inflamed. And that obviously affects behavior. It affects learning. It affects their sleeping patterns. Um, and oh, so, really? you know, so you'll see it play out in how they sleep. Oh, too. yes. Absolutely. And, you know, they may show up with eczema or they may show up with autoimmune type reactions, um, you know, all these different type things. So food is, is very, very important. But as Tammy said earlier, um, you know, almost every child that we see has, you know, food sensitivities and they have vitamin and mineral and amino acid deficiencies. But in almost every case, it's really because the brain isn't regulating the gut. And even though we give them, you can give them vitamins, but if their gut isn't absorbing it, it's just going to go right through them. If, they, if you take away foods that they're sensitive to, it reduces the inflammation and that's good, but they're just going to develop new food sensitivities unless because ultimately, the brain. unless you balance, but once you balance out the brain and the gut starts working properly and you produce proper acid, and you get a good blood flow to the gut, and you can absorb nutrients, now you don't have to be on special vitamins or minerals or special diets anymore. So well, what about, I have a question, what about pickiness? Would that's what I was just going to say, is that with, with my kids, you know, they were extremely, extremely picky, and there's multiple reasons for that, but one is they tested Wyatt and said he doesn't sniff. 
he can't even smell. If he can't smell, you can't taste. You don't even know what the food tastes like, right? And then oh, because of, I know. And then because of other certain things we can talk about, you know, their textures are off and, you know, the foods that they want to even try. Then if you have a very left brain child, they don't like anything new. They want everything that's the same, right? They don't want change. And so my boys had their four or five foods that they would eat every day for years. And almost all of them were the same color, you know? And even though I switched them and made almond flour bread with almond butter, or, you know, better things. It was still toast with, you know, peanut butter and, you know, chicken nuggets and French fries. I made them myself, but it was still the same types of foods and the same colors because there was no going out of that zone. And so, you know, it's hard because families, I mean, people would say, you need to feed them better. You need to give them vegetables and fruits. And I mean, we tried eating therapy. They would even get close to the food or touch it and they would gag or gag. throw up. There's no, some of these parents, moms know, if you have a really, really picky eater, you know that if you take those foods away, they will starve. And they don't understand the cause and effect. If I don't eat this, then, you know, I'm not going to get dinner. They're not even connecting with that. Even a very high So what you're saying child. is some of that pickiness might be driven by the brain. Not it's, it's completely. Yeah, it's driven from a couple of things. One is, as Tammy said, you know, every child that comes in, we do a standardized objective smell test. And 90% of the kids that come in, have completely abnormal and many of them have completely absent sense of smell that nobody has ever checked. No. Even when they've you gone to like, how would you even know? No, you wouldn't. You know, I, you wouldn't know. I would That's the thing. Do if your child doesn't smell anything, you usually don't know it. Yeah. But then moms will say, you know what? My other children, uh, I remember one mom said to me, you know, I had my other boys would come in when, when I was cooking something and they'd go, Oh mom, that smells good. But their child with autism would never do that. And then one day when we were working with him, one day he came in and he went, I smell cookies. And she went, you like, she, you'd never said that before. And she knew that it changed. But the important thing, and there was a recent study that just showed this in ADHD as well. But the important thing is that how do animals socialize? Animals socialize through sense of smell, right? And huh. the basis of much of human social skills is really in the same area of the brain that has something to do with our ability to smell. Really? So oh, when, when a child starts to smell, where we literally stimulate that, and we stimulate the area of the brain primarily on the right side that's responsible for that, they all of a sudden, they're not choosing food by how it looks or how it feels. They're judging it by how it smells and how it tastes. Because if you don't smell, you don't taste. So oh, they're right. judging it by smell and taste, which is the way they're supposed to judge it, not by, you know, a, a child with a picky eater will look at a, a food across the room and go, no, I'm not eating that. Well, how do you know? You know, yeah, you just look at it. How do you know that it's Well, and it's just, it. and it's different too, because even if I would take the sandwich that I made the same every day and cut it in a different shape, it was now different. It was not oh. the same as it was before. And so they, so they wouldn't eat it. Oh, but how frustrating as a mother. When, you're like, just when, eat the sandwich. When I got into brain balance, it was not more than, I don't know, a week that all of a sudden Wyatt started to sniff. And I noticed that because we were doing things to help. And he started eating new foods. I have one of my blog posts showing 60 something new foods in a, maybe a week period. He tried pineapple, strawberry, shrimp, soup, ate off a spoon the first time in his life. These foods that all of a sudden, oh, well, yeah, you know, again, if you were trying to eat spaghetti or a banana and you couldn't taste it, right? Like, it's yeah. going to just feel weird in well, your mouth. And the texture is all that you... Exactly. All that the texture and how it looks. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so all of a sudden, he okay, he'll eat oatmeal and fried eggs and all these different foods that not only he wouldn't even, you know, get by or, you know, touch, but he's now, sure, I'll try it, right? A, his, his brain is changing and saying, okay, I can handle something that's maybe new and different, but I can smell and, oh, this isn't so bad. And so... Yeah. And Brody did the same thing. So it's amazing because now they not only take in those foods with better nutrients and now their brain's saying, okay, now I can digest it properly. So everything's basically just working the way it was supposed to in the first place. And the other yeah. thing that can cause food um, issues is that um, if the gut isn't working properly, um, certain foods, especially dairy and wheat, if you notice, most of these kids become addicted to dairy and wheat in, in all combinations. They'll only eat cereal and milk or bagel and uh, cream cheese macaroni and or cheese. <laughs> macaroni and cheese. And it's because those two foods in particular, when they're not digested properly, the breakdown is what's called casomorphine and glutomorphine. Mm. 
that literally they're morphine like chemicals that are opiates. So what happens is they literally become addicted, physically addicted to those foods as if you were taking an opiate drug. And so, you know, they can't smell, they is can't that always, taste. So, I mean, once the brain's balanced, it doesn't have that. Once effect. the brain, once the brain is balanced and once their gut is working properly, then it doesn't happen anymore. Okay. Um, and then, and then they can eat gluten and dairy and, and, and it, those are foods that are typically good for them. Um, so, you know, that's the point. So there's a food addiction as well. And that's where they also become very picky and very restrictive. They judge food by how it looks and how it feels rather than how it tastes how and it smells. Tastes. And then they become addicted to dairy and wheat. And, and this is what you see the pattern of most kids that are really, really picky eaters. And it all really starts with their brain. With their and brain, one thing that I bring up to parents is just, I mean, to simplify it too, um, was just that when you have a child in the first six, say they're a six month old baby, you don't feed them wheat or bread, right? You know that you don't, they don't have dairy till at least one because why? They're really hard to break down, right? And so that's kind of the way I explain it to you. Our family's just, you know, why are these foods? Why is it this and not something else? And there's, you know, there's other reasons, but generally speaking, if we know our digestive system is not mature, we're definitely not going to be able to break down the hardest things to break down. I mean, there are people all over the world that are lactose intolerant, right? Yeah. They can't handle that. And so if we have an immature digestive system or gut, then it's going to be even harder, harder to do to that do. and cause those issues. But then, like he said, then you can bring those foods back in and they don't have the issue once the, once the gut is doing what it's supposed to and what just as one more thing families don't understand and I didn't how really what goes in your stomach affects your brain and people are getting that a little bit more you know and they're talking about you know the gut brain connection or you know the gut is the second brain and all of those things but it's you know the easiest way that it was is explained to me in the beginning because I thought why, why taking out a certain food is going to make my child improve in behaviorally or any of these things that made no sense to me besides, okay, sugar might make them hyper. Right. But yeah. I didn't really make that connection. And the thing that someone told me is if you, you know, if you go into a bar and people are drinking alcohol, right, it's going into their stomach, but it affects their brain. It affects th their cognition and their memory function and their it affects their ability to make good decisions, right? And so if it's foods that are literally causing an opiate effect or different things, it's going to affect the way that our brain functions. And so it was a simple way from a parent to kind of understand, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. yeah, I could see that play out and you might not notice it as much with the everyday kind of foods. Right. So let's right. move on. We talked about technology. We've talked about how diet might affect what about um so the environmental factors that you talked about a little bit right well you know ultimately the environmental factors really affect the parents more than the children um and they really affect uh and they cause what we call more epigenetic effects. I don't want to get overly technical, but the, the idea is that most people are told that these problems are genetic, which kind of implies that there's a genetic mutation, a physical change or damage to the DNA. And that's not true. I mean, in the vast majority of cases, that isn't, that isn't what we see at all. Um, but what happens is in epigenetics, it means that the DNA isn't damaged or deleted or not there, it's just not being turned on. So what happens is we're seeing that it's an effect on gene expression. And that gene expression is genes can be turned on or turned off and environmental factors will do that. They will create certain, like if we do bad things in our life, you know, as we all do, we don't get enough sleep, we have too much stress, we smoke cigarettes, we drink alcohol or whatever. It literally creates what we call methyl marks on our DNA, on your and my DNA, right? So what that does is it covers up part of our DNA segment. 85% of our DNA is there to build our brain as children. Um, and it doesn't affect you as an adult if it happens. But then when you go to have children, we used to think, that those kind of black marks, those methyl marks were wiped clean and a baby starts out with a clean genetic slate. And we know that that's not the case. That actually... Oh, okay, so like those, you might be predisposed to it and, and some choices you might make might turn those things on and then you pass on that or gene. Or turn them off. 
Right. So what happens is so if basically you reduce stress or eat healthy right. or reduce screen time. Yes. It might. And that's the good news. The difference is that genetic mutations, you can't change, but epi mutations, you can correct them. You can turn those genes back on by changing your lifestyle, by living healthy, by, you know, eating right, by getting rid of things that are, you know, or detoxifying your body. That's you can exciting. completely change that. And that, and again, I go through a whole program of how to understand this in my third book, Autism, The Scientific Truth. So there's an actual, you can really understand how to do that. But essentially what happens is things that cause inflammation and, uh, and increase stress responses in our body, they affect the way our genes are going to be regulated. And when men and women get together, it can affect that. But it can also affect the child themselves as the child's developing. If they have inflammation in their body, if they're not moving enough, if they're not interacting with their environment, it won't turn on the genes that build their brain. So the right side of the brain is being built in the womb and for the first two to three years of life. And so the right side of the brain is being built during that period of time. That's why Tammy says you don't need to do the left brain stuff then because that's why baby Einstein actually showed that it actually made babies dumber. It actually didn't it, because they weren't moving and doing right because that's a whole left brain type of skill. And if you, if you stimulate the left brain too early, you retard the development of the right brain which is really what's going to build the foundation for intelligence. So what we see is that that's why looking at milestones is so important. A baby should roll over to both sides at three to five months. If they only roll over to one side, you're already looking at an imbalance. If they, oh, you know, if yeah. they crawl in, a, in an unusual way on their belly, like where they drag one leg, you already see an imbalance developing. If a child comes out and they already have an overactive immune response, they already have an imbalance in their brain. Um, and if we see that they don't crawl normally, they don't walk on time, a child has to walk the latest, the end of 13 months. If they don't walk by 14 months, they are delayed. But yet, if you go to your pediatrician, pediatrician will say, well, you know, if they don't walk by 16 months, you know, that, but you know, that's okay. okay. That's and and if they don't right. crawl, it's okay. They're completely wrong. And, so they're not and so that's going to account for what's not firing in the brain by them not walking at that point. They, they, you know, I think that's an important thing Tammy and I talk about a lot is that the average parent out there, and we understand that, thinks that if there's something wrong with my child, my pediatrician will tell me. Yeah. Um, and if they don't tell me, then, you know, Nothing it's not wrong. a big yeah. issue. And if I ask them about it and they say, oh, don't worry about it, then I don't need to worry about it. And quite honestly, uh, they are wrong more than they're right uh, as far as that. The point is that the pediatrician is there mainly to keep your child very healthy from a basic standpoint. Like they don't get infections. They don't die. Yeah. They don't have anything really serious. Yeah. But as far as really subtle developmental issues that really are at the core of these problems, they are completely untrained. They really don't know. They, they really have a problem with that for the most part. Not all of them, of course. Right. I just recently did a lecture in, in Naples, Florida, and I had a pediatric neurologist who came to hear me speak. And I said to him, you know, what are you, what are you trying to do? What do you look at as the problem in the brain in children with these disorders? And he said, well, nobody knows, right? And I was like, wow, that's so, I mean, there's so much research out there now. I mean, I've published a lot of research, but I mean, there's ev new research every day as to, you know, understanding what's happening. And here's a pediatric neurologist who works with this every day, and he has absolutely no clue. Mm. Um, and, but all of his people that are coming there think that he knows everything and thinks that he know they, that, that he's up on the latest research. They're clinicians. They're not researchers. Clinical medicine is not science. It's very important that people understand that. And it's very important that people look at milestones and are aware of them. And those are and, your books, uh, right? The different milestones and what they the have book. to and, have. And, and I think we're going to include that in, in the bonus right. package too of like, yeah, so people right. can kind of track and see. Yeah. What I'm going to put together is I put together and for your people, I have this, if they go to my website, drrobertmalillo.com and they sign up, 
they will get a, um, an educational program for free that I put together that will talk to them about milestones and primitive reflexes and how to understand and, and identify if they're off and then exercises that they can simply do at home to help remediate them. The same type of exercises we do at Brain Balance. So. Okay. So from, from a mom perspective, you know, I, I had my child and I see these little things that just seemed a little different. And, you know, of course, the last thing we ever want to think as a parent is there could be anything wrong. Yeah. And in this day and age, I mean, I had been worried before I had a child. I was worried about autism. Well, you know, nobody knows. It's so mysterious. How's it, you know, what's going to happen? And, and, um, when I saw Wyatt start to do these different things, you know, he was lining his trains up and he had them in color order or, you know, watching the wheels spin. I was like, I've seen the symptoms and I was worried. And I went into my pediatrician and I said, Hey, I'm concerned. I think there's some things that are off. And he said, Oh no, no, he's fine. He's just the second child. He'll talk a little later. You know, his brother's talking for him. And, you know, so of course that's what I want to hear. Right. And yeah. so I go yeah. home and I go, okay, okay, great. And then I, go back again and three, four months later, something's still not working. He's not responding to his name really anymore. I'm not seeing some of these things move forward, which is hard if it's your first child, by the way, because you don't always know I what to know. look for. But as I watched this, I went back, hey, I know there's something wrong. I'm concerned he might have autism. And he said, oh no, you know, a child with autism wouldn't come even over to you like he is or connect with you or he'd be banging his head on the wall. And I thought, okay, I even know that that's not every child with autism, you know? And so, you know, I'd be the most severest case, but not every, exactly. I'd there's exactly. And so, and he really didn't have any resources, any help, and he really still didn't think that he had anything wrong when I knew there was something that was off, you know. Now, even a child that's way more mild than Wyatt, moms know something's not clicking. Something's not connecting here, right? And so, you know that, but the problem is I was going to who I thought was the right person. And, and like he said, pediatricians are great for what they're supposed to be doing their background really isn't in development or the brain or neurology that's not really or nutrition right right yeah, and so those are that's not what they study which is fine but we kind of just generally that's where we go as parents because we think that's what we should do and 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 on top of that you know not every doctor or pediatrician is really is going to be a great one. And I brought that up to somebody once because I said, well, my doctor said, and I said, okay, I said, what about lawyers? Lawyers go to, to school for a very long time, right? And do we think that every lawyer is a good lawyer and they all have our best interest at heart, you know? And they were like, oh, well, I guess not. But for some reason, we feel like doctors all, yeah. you know, know everything. And, and again, it's, it's not against them. It's just that it's a different, a different area. And, so for me, I they're was kind doing of, their job that they're set out to do to help with ear infections, to help with those things. But I can see what right. you're saying where they might not be trained as exactly. in some of these other areas because that's not what they're there and to so do. My know? concern right. as a parent, which I know was yours too, Desi, when we talked about this, which is I don't ever want to have another baby. I'm going to have a baby, right? I already have one with issues, so my next one's going to have issues, and I'm I'm scared out of my mind that that I can't I can't do this again, right? Yeah. But then, you know, learning what what Dr. Malolo and his new book is so great, and even though it says the word autism on it and it scares people, it it's it's really covers everything. If you want your child to develop normally and on track and be intelligent and have all the things that they need, like it's it's the same, you know, it's the same thing, you know, but to follow those same types of of uh, good environmental and, and, um, yeah. Cause you might not read the book thinking, well, my child doesn't have autism, but I think I like that you brought that up that, right. You know, it's great to track those milestones to see where they're at, to do those exercises or things where they might be delayed. Right. And to, to help, help yourself them. get ready before you have the child, which is the big thing, right? Because I didn't know that. I knew that while I was pregnant, I shouldn't eat garbage, right? I mean, yeah. I knew that. You know, it's pretty common sense. But I didn't think that the things I ate a year before or five years before or my husband was eating were literally affecting my child and how they were going to develop. I didn't know that. And so the whole point is educating people so they do know. And then when you do, you can change it. And then when I had my next, I was already pregnant with one when Wyatt was diagnosed and I I thought, okay, well, now I'm going to have three with these issues. But even the small things I learned about diet and technology and different things and started avoiding those different, you know, toxins, then I saw, oh, okay, we're developing more normally. And then I had another son and... 
all those things, again, I was able to prepare myself. I had changed my lifestyle and diet as well as with him. I knew he started rolling only one direction. I got to switch it. I had to make him go the other way. You know, and luckily he was crawling on the proper pattern, but if they're not, you have to help them. And that's something like he said, it's been studied for decades that if you don't crawl, it's connected to reading and right, learning disabilities. It's, and so if, if people say, oh, it's okay to skip it, you know, it's not. No, I mean, that's been for a long time. So the thing that's great is that the tools that Dr. Miller can offer and what our program offers are things, you know, to prevent these issues from getting bigger. You know, like you said, there might be some underlying thing, but if you make sure that you do the right things from now forward, you're going to be able to, to help that and not be afraid to have another baby and have, you know, yeah. have a child that they're going to have these issues. You'll have those tools to know how to help them develop properly. You know, I think you covered that. My next question was, so what can we do today Mm -hmm. You know, to help our children, if we feel like there might be a delay, um, it sounds like your book is a great resource to teach them those tools. If you really want more help, it, tell us the resources that are out there. You mentioned your website to sign up. Yeah, I think I think the main thing is that um, if you notice that your child has this unevenness of skills, um, and again, you know, some parents will look at it and it's hard, it's confusing. They'll say, well, they seem to have delays in, in everything. So what we typically see is some children have like a left brain delay and really high right brain skills. Those are children that may struggle academically in school, but they're really good socially and emotionally, and they may be physically athletic. Um, you, you other children that have a right brain delay with a left brain really strong, these are children that really do typically do good academically, but they struggle behavior and social and with their body issues. Um, and then we get kids that are overall delayed. They're globally delayed. They have right brain and left brain skills that are delayed. But even there, there are some skills, there's usually certain skills that stand out. Like they may have a really good memory or something, or they may be really good with Legos. Um, but what we see is those kids have a lot of, they've missed most of their milestones or skipped over things or they, have, they still have a lot of what we call primitive reflexes that are still there that are supposed to be gone within the first year. And so their whole brain is globally delayed, but there's still this underlying imbalance at the core. So, the, you know, when we're looking at that, I think the important thing is that if your child clearly has certain skills that they're really good at and they have this unevenness, even if they didn't have any milestone delays, they probably have an imbalance. If they, but they probably had some milestone delays as they well. They didn't recognize. Maybe. Yeah, you didn't recognize it, um, or it might have been very subtle. Um, even you know, a child might have walked at 15 months, and it, you know, and that that wasn't recognized as a delay, but it actually is. Well, or um, if they walk at seven months or eight months, right? That's right, or too early. They didn't right. crawl enough. Yep. Yeah, and you know, so if your child. Um, has, you know, that type of thing, if they've missed their milestones, if they have it, this unevenness of skills, then most likely they have this problem in their brain. And so, you know, getting one of my books, Disconnected Kids, going through the checklist, and then getting this program that, like I said, that they have a chance to get so that they can really learn more about it and how they can assess this on their own child, that's the place to start. And let me tell you, if you change those things, if you right off the bat start improving their movement skills, um, sometimes you can resolve the whole problem just by doing that alone. Um, but if you can, and in your book you have specific exercises that stimulate those parts yes. of the brain that aren't and, uh, and, and and not just physical, but sensory stimulation. And there's eye exercises. There's also types of music and sound that they can listen to. And and then there's diet and nutrition tips. And there's also different cognitive types of activities as well as behavioral interventions as well. So all of that is in the book. But if not, then, you know, they can seek out a Brain Balance Center like Tammy has. If they go to brainbalancecenters.com, you know, and they can go in and get their child assessed and really find out, you know, objectively what's really happening. And in most centers, it's, it's really inexpensive yeah. to do that. I mean, it's like under $300 in most yeah. centers to get the most comprehensive assessment that they'll ever get. 
And it's it's no so so eye opening and, and with with my story we talked about early I'll, I'll kind of sum up but I the first thing I did was read Destiny to Kids and you know a friend gave it to me and I started reading it and I was like oh my word these are my children they have left brains and no right brains essentially right but but on top of that too when I went to the center which at the time I had to move all the way across the country because there weren't very many. And I sat there and they said, your child doesn't sniff, which is why we have these eating issues. Your child, Brody, who's very smart and can read very, very well above level, but hates it and will fight you to the death, his eye movements don't work. They're not going side to side. He can't cross his eyes, you know, and he can't look up at the board and back down this way. Um, he couldn't ride a bike and they said his core strength is way underdeveloped. His coordination is underdeveloped. That I, I knew he was kind of clumsy, but I didn't realize that that was so connected, you know, and they said in his ability ability to have good balance and spatial things and again not turn his head like this when he's riding the bike they're just not there and they can pinpoint every single area of what's actually happening not only right and left but those different functions that just never started working or didn't finish developing and so then as they start to develop those through the center which is what my voice did then the things change. Then they eat, and then they ride a bike, and then they love reading. And I can't make him stop now. I mean, he reads books all day Aww. long, you know, and because he already had so many of those great pieces. He just, these few were in the way. And as soon as that happened, click, right? And so then I'm going, okay, three months, four, five, six months, you know, our kids come to brain balance. And that first even initial three that I was back east, completely different children. Even after the five what years, all the other you things, it, you know, focus was better. Attention was better. Hyperactivity was gone. Meltdowns almost completely gone. Because an eight-year-old should not still be melting down and falling on the ground and crying over writing a sentence or taking away a screen or that they have to go to bed now. That's not normal. Now, the things they're doing are normal, just not for their age, right? It's normal for a kid to have a meltdown, just not at eight. It's normal for a kid not to be able to ride a bike just not at eight or yeah. 15 I mean we have them coming in at 15 16 that still are chewing on their shirt and putting things in their mouth and biting their fingernails these things aren't typical for their age their brain is still stuck in certain areas and so when we found that out and saw, yeah, my boys didn't, you know, chew on their shirt all day anymore. Why it was potty trained in two weeks after all those years no. of not being able to do it. Because he, before that, he couldn't feel his body. He didn't know that he had to go. He didn't recognize the signal. His brain didn't make the connection that he should probably do it in the toilet and not on the Is floor. Is the same with bedwetting? Bedwetting is definitely, it's, you know, they're all connected. And we have, we have kids that come in just for bedwetting or just for picky eating or just for some stomach or digestive issues or just for focus issues or kids with way bigger issues. Like you said, it's all the same problem, just different areas that are affected. And maybe the but, severity of the imbalance too. Exactly. And so as my kids went through, I now had a child that I could put into school who had been homeschooling for years that was able to go right into school and socially he could read people. He said to me one day, I, I apparently made a face. And he looked at me and he goes, I can tell by the face you just made that I wasn't supposed to do that. And he never, ever could see that. But he was a smart kid and he recognized it now and he verbalized it and like, he told wait me. Wait a minute, mom's not happy. Uh huh. And he before was like, sports aren't my thing. And he didn't want anything to do with it. And even before we got out of the Brain Moms program, he said, I want to get in karate. And then we got home and he said, I want to play flag football. Before that, why do you want to catch a football if you have no hand eye coordination? It's going to hit you in the face. He knew that. Yeah. So he avoided it. And once he he had the skill he wanted it and he and he was eager to do that and so so all these things now with Brody he's such this typical kid and he even says I'm probably the most balanced person in the house that's his uh, <laughs> you probably are I'm way more balanced than you and mom and dad well, and that's, that's cool though because he was already intelligent so he had that now he has both right and that's what we all want right is to have both of them and so with the book I had read it I had gone through it I had tried to do some of the assessment exercises depending on the child and how you know the the severity too, you know, like you said, it might help. Like this ultra severe, but there was a lot more issues going on than I realized, right? And even doing the assessment in the book took me a week to go through and get him to do it. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't focus. I couldn't get him to look at the pen. And I thought, I don't have the expertise or neurology background or anything to actually make sure I do this right, which is why I said, I need to go to a center and, and do this the yeah. right way from, you know, all the way through to make sure that these kids are, are developed. Um, 
Because a lot of these things, depending on the child, parents can't get them to do it. They can't get them to do the exercises. They, yeah. you know, they want they want to do it. The book says, "Great, do these things every day this many times." If you can't get your child to do it, then you can't do it, right? But yeah. the center has ways to do it at an accelerated. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's it's a lot faster. Plus, you know, kids always do better for other people, and yes. they're doing with these these centers. And so, and then then the centers are able to help. The, the, the parents help them with their questions help them support them with those extra behavioral things and, and you know, it's, I, think, you know, I think they're both great resources that you've yes. given us this yep. you know the book to start there to kind of evaluate if this is something that you think is going on with your child and then if you want more help than what you can do at home then there's definitely centers available and right. you know I asked you guys to speak because I think this is Something that maybe a lot of parents haven't heard of, a lot of moms listening, and if you might be going through these things with your own children, it gives you a lot of hope to know that the brain is moldable, that we can do things to help them, and maybe they can't control some of the behaviors that you're seeing at home, because that can be incredibly frustrating if you're like, just get your homework done. You know what I mean? But maybe, like you're saying, they can't track enough to read, and so it's incredibly frustrating for them. So thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Robert Malo, and thank you so much, Tammy, for giving us both perspectives from a mom's perspective and from a neurological perspective of what's going on and what we can do to help these our kids because we want we know they have potential and we yes. want them yeah. to rise to that potential well, that's what i always say is that the kids that this happens to are really kids that are gifted that they have areas of the brain that are typically stronger than most and so they're more prone to having an imbalance if the other side doesn't develop the way it's supposed to. So these kids are really very special kids. They're actually gifted. We get kids that go from special ed to gifted programs. Right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, once they get their brain balanced, that happens all the time. Well, so, you know, the, the sense of hope for parents is just so important that in almost any case, um, we can they, they can make significant changes, if not completely change their child's life, uh, even from just the book. Uh, I get letters every week from people that just do the book and have had completely miraculous changes. And, you know, I think it's not just the child, it's the whole family. It really oh, does affect everyone involved. And, everyone. you know, I think it, it plays out with everybody. So thank you two so much for coming on. I know there's so much more we could talk about, and I would love to. So um, we will flash over the screen where we can find you guys and the resources that are available for moms listening that want to know more. So thank you so much, you guys, and have the best day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie.